Um, and for our last uh, presentation of the open science uh, theme, we have Ludovic Kufes here with us, and his presentation is ready and everything is ready, so I'm not going to say anything else, and I'm going to give you the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Bonsoir. So I know I'm the last speaker before we can finally have a break, so I am trying to be to the point. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Ludovic Cortes. I work uh, at Tinry as a research engineer in Bordeaux, and I work primarily on uh, GNU Geeks, which is a software deployment tool. So uh, let's see what this is all about. Um, so we've been talking all day long about open science and reproducible research and so on and so forth. So I won't go into details, but uh, what you know, there uh, people are caring now about reproducible research at last. And this is good. So, for example, this is the ACM, the Association for Computer Machinery, uh, which is one of the main um, um, societies in, uh, in computer science research. They have badges that can, you know, the, that allow them to say this paper is reproducible. We've actually verified the results and, and things like that. So, things are moving in the right direction, and this is good. Uh, but there is still some work to do, and we know what we know what we want to have, what the grail is. So we have initiatives, so we have those badges, for example, from the ACM, and we have initiatives like ReScience. So I don't know if you've heard of the ReScience Journal before. It's an initiative uh, started by colleagues of mine, actually, um, that tries to, to get people to reproduce, to publish reproductions of existing results, right? So it's not just, you know, theoretical. We want to make sure that we can actually reproduce results that appear in papers, and so for this, they created a special journal where people can submit reproductions or failures of reproductions of results. And this is kind of the grade, you know, if we can have that, then we have a solid foundation scientific procedure. And at the other end of the spectrum, of course, we have software heritage. Uh, we know that, you know, if we have scientific work that depends on source code, then we first need to have source code available. And this is where software heritage comes in, obviously. Uh, but in between, we need something, right? We need something to be able to take that source code, actually build it, and that's not trivial for me, and actually run it on the right input data like we just shown, so you can reproduce the result. And Gix is, in a way, it's, it's one possible solution to that, you know, to bridge the gap. So you can take that source code, build it, and finally run it to reproduce the result. So, of course, reproducible research is more than this. You also need data to be available, uh, as we did before. So, you need more things to actually have reproducible research. But if you don't have source code, or if you don't have reproducible software deployment, then the rest is just not going to work. All right, so, the, yeah, I should say, so I will arrows here, a bit, but it's really bidirectional in the sense that. You really want to be able to have problems tracking. You really want to be able to take the paper, take the PDF, for example, and go back to the to the actual binary that you run, and also be able to take those binaries that you run and go back to the source code that presumably led to those binaries. Um, so it's all about problems tracking and transparency. So bidirectional error. And usually, when when we talk about reproducing you know, with reducible deployment, people focus on just this part and forget about the link from source code to binaries. That's kind of a problem. So typically people talk about Docker, container images, virtual machines. Um, and that's kind of a problem because those virtual images, virtual machine images or Docker images are opaque usually. So you cannot really say, you cannot verify whether the, the binaries in those images actually correspond to the source code that it's supposed to correspond to. So that, that's kind of a problem. It's a bit like smoothies, that, that's a friend of mine who said that you can say whether it's to your taste, but you can't really say what's inside of it, right? All right, so, so much for the introduction. So Geeks HPC is, is what I work on at Tinry. It's an uh, network with other institutions where we're trying to uh, to see how we can use geeks in high performance computing, HPC, and in reproducible science, you know, as a foundation for reproducible workflows in HPC or not in HPC. Um, I, I'm kind of a geek, so I'll go into <laughs> some more technical details this command line. 
<laughs> don't be scared if you're not into that. <laughs> Uh, so what gigs? So basically, like I said, it's, it's essentially a package manager or a Gnu Linux distribution, which means that if you've ever used something like APT on Debian or uh, PIP for Python, you know, things like that, it's, it's very similar. You, you have a command line interface where you can say gigs install blah, and it's going to install that package for you. Um, you don't need to be root for this. Uh, you need to have the daemon running as root. This, yeah, it can be a problem on, on HQC clusters. You have to convince system administrators that it's doable with them. <laughs> um, it has a bunch of quite unusual features. For example, every installation, every upgrade is transactional, which means that you can always roll back to the previous state. And it can also manage uh, software environments pretty much like virtual end, if you use that for um, Python or modules, which is a, a tool that's commonly used in HQC. You can say if that environment containing Python, SciPy, and Scikit-Learner is going to build on the fly an environment that contains precisely those three packages. So that, that's the main idea. Um, you can also say, you know, instead of typing a bunch of commands, you can also say, all right, I'm going to store in a file everything I want to, to deploy. And for example, I'm going to store in a file this, this three lines, which basically say, all right, I want to deploy these three packages, Python, scikit-learn, matplotlib, and then you can pass it to Geek's package and it's going to deploy precisely those three packages. So that's pretty convenient because obviously you can have that file under version control, you can share it with colleagues, you can you know, do that, that kind of thing. There is still one thing missing if you're trying to reproduce that environment because as you can see, there are no version numbers, nothing here, right? So if I run it now, maybe I'm going to get Python 3.8, but if I run it six months from now, maybe I'm going to get Python 4, I don't know. Uh, so something's missing. And the, the additional bit of information that we need to actually reproduce the exact same environment is the, the revision of gigs that we're using. So in a nutshell, you can imagine we have Bob uh, running gigs on his laptop. And Bob has that manifest file, mypackages.stm. And in addition, Bob can run gigs describe, which tells which gigs revision is being used right now. <coughs> and with these two bits of information, the manifest plus the, the commit ID here, uh, Bob can send that information to Alice, who's running gigs on a completely different machine. And Alice can say, all right, gigs tool, that commit. And from there, she can run this package, she dash dash manifest, and redeploy the exact same environment. That's more ambitious than using a Docker image, for example, because we're really potentially rebuilding the whole thing, right? And we're preserving the, that provenance tracking link between binaries and source code, right? So it's it's more ambitious, but it also it also gives stronger guarantee. So I like to say, I'm, I'm getting a bit old, so I have references to old movies, but maybe I'm not the only one here, I don't know. Um, I like to say that Gix allows you to travel in space and time in the sense that, you know, you can redeploy the same environment on different machines, but you can also redeploy, redeploy that environment at different points in time. So like six months from now, a year or two years from now. That's the idea. And because in every talk I, I I mentioned, you know, time traveling. Somebody eventually came up with that time machine command, obviously, <laughs> where you can, in one go, say, I first want to travel to that particular commit of gigs, and from there I want to deploy Python, for example. All right, so I talk a lot, I talk a lot about um, time travel. The battery is low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but obviously, <laughs> For the audience here, you might have guessed that something's missing. So if we look more closely at how a package is defined in Gix, it looks like this. So it's pretty much the same kind of thing you would see with any similar tool, right? If you use uh, if you use Linux, if you use Debian, whatever. At some point, you have metadata like this, you know, with the name of the package, um, the URL where you're fetching the source, how you're building it, and so on and so forth. But obviously, if we take this package, what if that uh, git repo disappears at some point? Well, then we're no longer able to rebuild the package, 
so they're no longer able to to deploy the software. That's kind of a problem. Um, guess what? <laughs> That's where software heritage comes in. <laughs> so from there, we can we know which commits we are looking for. So we can Gix can actually already um, starting from a few years ago uh, query software heritage. It can say, hey. I didn't find that commit upstream at this URL. Do you have that commit? Yes, I do. <laughs> so from there, we can fetch the source and again build the, the whole thing. And you can learn more on this blog post. So far, so good. Um, so obviously, we need to be able to tell software heritage that we want to archive a certain number of, of uh, pieces of source code, right? So we developed a tool, well, we have a tool that's called Geeklint, which takes care of a number of um, you know, checks um, to make sure, quality assurance of packages, if you will. And one of these tools within Geeklint is the archival tool. And the archival tool will tell you whether the source code of the package is archived on software heritage. And if not, it will schedule uh, archival of the source code directly on software heritage using the, the JSON API, the HTTP API of Software Heritage, state code now, as you all know. <laughs> and this is just great because it allows us to kind of make sure that when we add a new package to Gix, it's going to be saved uh, in Software Heritage. Um, on top of that, so this is this is kind of the push model where we Gix users push software to uh, Software Heritage. But on top of that, um, there is another method which is that the Gix project publishes that sources.json file, which is basically a big list of uh, source code URLs. And Software Heritage takes that list and archives automatically that periodically. And this is thanks to people at Twig, Antoine Esch, and to the Software Heritage team. So this is now automatically ingested periodically, so we don't even need to push to Software Heritage. Software Heritage will pull it from us, which is great. So mission accomplished, not quite. So I showed the easy example where a source code is taken from a Git repo, right? But it turns out that in most cases, in 66% of, of the of the Git packages that we have today, I just checked yesterday, uh, source code actually comes from tarball source, archive, you know, like tar gz or zip archive. Um, this creates an impedance mismatch with software heritage because software heritage takes care of archiving contents, you know, so it archives the contents of the archive, it does not archive the, the archive, the table intent, right? So for us, it's kind of a problem because we, what we need here is to be able to fetch the, the table, even if in reality we care about what's inside the table, but we still need to fetch the table somehow because what we specify here as as a way to check the integrity of the source code is the, the, the hash of the table itself, not the hash of the content. So we've we've thought about different ways to address this this mismatch here that we had. Um, eventually, we we thought that we need to find a way to reconstruct tables from archive contents. So that there could be different approaches, but that particular approach seemed to be worth for us to discuss the details later. But anyway, so our question for us, these people, is how can we reconstruct tables from archive contents so that we can actually benefit from software heritage, even for packages whose source code is in a table? And so we came up with a, a tool that's called this archive. Um, the idea is pretty simple. We take a table, a tar gz file, and we sort of disassemble it, which means that we separate it into two things. On one hand, we have the actual contents of the table, which is what Software Heritage uh, preserves. And on the other hand, we have table metadata. So you know all the tar headers, the gzip compression methods that, that are used, you know, things like that. And with these two bits, we're normally able to reassemble the original archive, right? And this is now used in, in production for Gix, so, which means that now Gix is automatically able to fall back to software heritage plus our 
this archive database. And from these two things, it's able to reconstruct tables, so we don't need source code for tables, which is great. Um, so where are we? Uh, so this is a graph from the from the report and the preservation of Gix uh, that's been cooked up by Timothy Sample, someone who contributes to Gix, and who actually designed and implemented this archive we called to earlier. Um, so what does it show? Well, it is it basically shows for each commit at each date of Gix since version 1.0 of Gix. Um, just how many packages are available in Software Heritage, this is the gray part. How many are definitely missing, this is the red part. And the gray part is the unknown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what is the unknown? Well, there are technicalities like, for example, uh, this archive does not take care get of, um, of tarballs other than gzip. So for example, if you have a tar that xz tarball, then it doesn't know how to handle it yet. Um, there are also cases where you have weird tables. <laughs> you know the problem of weird uh, things in, in software heritage and weird git objects, for example, that, that's similar. Um, so weird tables, for example, we are not able to find out how they were compressed, even if they use Jesus, right? So we don't know how to recompress them. Um, and then there's the red part, the missing bits, and for this, we don't know. We basically need to investigate one by one what's going on. It could be a problem in Geeks proper, it could be a problem in Software Heritage. So we have to find out exactly what's going on. Yeah, that's the situation. So now, uh, if you take the latest uh, revision of Geeks, about 73% are definitely archived in Software Heritage. And then we have the red and gray part. So there's a lot of work ongoing um, in this area. So we want to increase double coverage in this archive. So being able to handle uh, compression methods other than gzip, for example. We need to replicate the this archive database that I mentioned earlier. It's a very small database, but it's crucial because if we lose it, we lose the mapping from tables to content. Um, and we want to archive source code that past Gix revisions refer to. Uh, because potentially we may want to be able to reproduce all these revisions. A lot of other things, and eventually, of course, our goal is to get 100% coverage of, um, of all the source code that Geeks refers to in Software Heritage. Uh, I presented many different pieces of work. Uh, I should say that this is thanks to a number of people, and in particular, Timothy Sample, who implemented this archive. And, um, you know, prepare those uh, preservation of Geeks reports. There's Simon Tournier at the uh, University of Paris, who's been taking care also of monitoring, you know, software heritage coverage and things like that. There's Antoine Esch, previously at uh, Twig, who implemented the mixed Geeks loader inside software heritage, which is what allows us to, uh, to push things to software heritage. And of course, the Software Heritage team has been instrumental in helping us you know, develop all these tools. All right, so wrapping up. So this is the, the, the big picture, the, the goal, right? <laughs> what we want to achieve. We want to, be that, to provide that tool here that can actually rebuild, redeploy software from source code. Um, and we're getting there. And eventually, if we look at scientific workloads, we are really trying to achieve something that's, that's kind of similar in spirit to what you presented with language, my language, <laughs> uh, which is to basically be able to describe a complete uh, scientific pipeline. So going from source code, from data, and eventually reaching the final PDF paper dot PDF file that we all care about, right? <laughs> um, and we want to be able to describe all this within the Geeks framework so we can have a fully uh, you know, reproducible pipeline, fully inspectable, with problem spiking and everything, and archival and all that. Um, we've actually prototyped that uh, as part of the Resilience uh, 10 Years with Disability Challenge that took place last year. Um, and, you know, it, it works. <laughs> it just needs some expertise. So our goal now is to make it more uh, approachable by, uh, by people who are not so much into gigs, for example like developing appropriate interfaces, so this is actually usable by everybody. 
um, so to conclude, I think you know there is the this reproducibility crisis, and it's kind of weird because we've been using more and more uh, programs, uh, software, you know, as part of the scientific workflows, but this has led to to less reproducibility in many cases, right? Because it's just you know kind of counterintuitive. Because simply we were not able to reproduce the software environments that, that were used to produce those plots, those papers, and so on and so forth. And I think we should we should think of deployment tools as, as tools that will that will actually improve, not degrade, problem tracking, improve reproducibility, and also permit experimentation, right? We don't simply want to redeploy the exact same thing. We produce the exact same results, usually as part of the scientific process. We also want to be able to experiment, you know, change things here and there and see what happens. And I think this should be the goal for deployment tools as part of the reproducible research uh, framework. This is it. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.